Welcome to Data Sent IR and to the webinar. Friday, 12, 12 o'clock noon. Hope everybody's having a nice day today. Uh, today we're going to talk about electrical, mechanical, PPM, mostly electrical, predictive, preventive maintenance. But I want to quickly run through uh, who we are and what we're doing here. I'm Greg Stockton, and I have three companies, three infrared companies that I operate. And those companies are all uh, have a different type of uh, mantra. Um, but together with Peter Hopkins, this fellow, we are United Infrared, and we're the two principals. Uh, Peter has a lot of experience in the uh, in the area of buildings and infrared, and he and I started the company uh, um, about two years ago, and we've experienced uh, a lot of growth, and so it's working real well. Um, the staff. Cindy Hawks is our marketing director. Tricia Smith, the office manager. Mike Halls, IT director. And Ken English is our social media director. Uh, the way this works is we have technical directors for each kind of division application, what we call module. Um, and just to introduce these people that are in our current modules, you got Dr. Joanna Robson, a veterinarian and an infrared thermographer of some import. Mike DiLeonardo, a very famous farrier. Together they do equine IR. Um, Dr. Bob Matting and lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and he's doing our elect he's the technical director for electric IR which we will launch this coming week um, after working on it for several months to build the um, the class materials and and get all our stuff together on it uh, roof scan IR Ben and Tyler Hickson uh, they are Hickson consultants as their day job and they uh, teach and support our members on flat roofs, low slope roofs. Uh, Howard Vix is the new energy scan IR technical director. He's going to help Peter um, with that module. We welcome him. Scott Wood is a very famous building scientist and the technical director for a moisture find IR. And then the two fellows here for Data Sent IR. You have uh, Eric Stockton, and he works for Stockton Infrared and is a uh, vice president of Stockton Infrared and uh, also um, is in charge of our computer uh, center services and our electrical and mechanical services. And John Finlayson, who is uh, Canopus 456 LLC and he does a lot of technical work and, and manages all the uh, 3D imaging um, for and the, and the panoramic imaging for our data sent IR service. Now the need for infrared thermography not only the thermal mapping but also the electrical and mechanical predictive maintenance is pretty understandable because you have you have any kind of building needs to have the switch gear check, but because of the high availability requirements, data centers need special special care, and the downtime is just tremendously expensive and so doing the thermal mapping keeps you from overheating the data center and doing the electrical predictive maintenance keeps it from you from having failures. 
just to get, I'm just going to run through a couple of pictures. Um, this is typical equipment that's in the computer room. You separately you have battery rooms and you have switch gear rooms and a lot of times you have a different room for the telecommunications equipment but these are the types of things that while we're doing um, infrared thermography doing the 3D ceilings or doing the panoramic viewing we see stuff like this and, and, and it's a predictive maintenance item but it's still found on our on our mapping services. Um, you know, you got the batteries trickle charge during most of the time and that is a separate kind of test from when you do full discharge testing. So uh, we're going to show some pictures of that later. Of course the heart of the system is the, the um, UPS system and there's very typical problems that happen uh, with respect to electrical connections. We're very, very picky about all these. When it's time to um, come by and make sure that these these circuits are running perfect, we're we're always monitoring what kind of load is on the equipment and and making sure that we are very, very picky about reporting. Um, of course, the PDUs are how the power gets distributed out. And to burn in these uh, PDUs, oftentimes we start with uh, low loads, and we check them at low load, and then they'll increase the load. And we check it at that. And that way, you don't do any damage, especially when you're putting these in into service. And uh, there's a lot of work that on the resistive load bank testing um, that comes in. And they, these are just typical things that we find. This is a very simple looking, just a little electric plug, but it's not plugged in. And same thing here. Um, the power strips have sure become a lot better. And they put monitoring equipment on them now. They've become a lot better than they used to be. Uh, we used to find a lot of problems on these strips, and and those the numbers of problems have definitely gone down over the last couple of years since they started doing these a little bit differently. There, here's one that you know this is one side of this bus duct connector, and I, and obviously you got a problem here. Um, this equated to saving about $32 million worth of equipment, so it was no small find. So now I want to just, because some of you may not have been on the, um, the call last Friday, or the, the webinar last Friday, I have a video I want to play. It's, it's only a few, it's only two or three minutes, and it shows our, our service. Welcome to DataCent IR. My name is John Finlayson, and I am one of the technical directors. This is an introduction to the ThermalMap IR viewer. Thermal mapping produces a huge amount of data. Pop-up thumbnail images allow for quick previews while exploring the data. Clicking the icon brings up the detailed images. Up to four images are presented for each location. These images can be scrolled and zoomed. All of the images are synchronized so that the same equipment is shown for each image. Down the aisle images can provide important information about a data center. They capture the heat signatures on the rack grids. This helps to understand airflow. They provide a limited but useful depiction of the floor ceiling rack interaction. The interface provides a compass that can be used to jump to neighboring locations. Images of the walls are important for understanding the status of the room. Problems such as inadequate insulation and defective equipment can be detected. The floors and ceilings are captured and combined into single images. These can be compared and examined in detail. The floor and ceiling images are also presented with map images so that the details can be located against clear references. 
at the end of the day, it is important to understand what you can gain from creating a thermal map. Here are three examples. This floor map allows for several findings. There is a blockage under the floor that prevents adequate cooling of the rightmost line of servers. There is overconditioning in the lower left corner. This could allow for reducing energy costs. It could provide a place to add new high energy density equipment. It helped to find that a crack unit was low on Freon and how the cycle plan interacted with the floor blockage to lead to inadequate cooling of the most critical servers. The servers in this image are functioning in a normal manner. In each rack, a router has been placed to make wiring easy. This resulted in the routers using the exhaust air from the servers for input. As a result, the routers are operating at a very high temperature. This one image identified a failure situation that threatened $32 million in equipment. Documenting complex 3D ceilings makes use of spherical panoramic images. This allows for issues to be identified in the areas between the ceiling and the server tops when ceiling mosaics cannot be created. Links to thermal map server views are also included. This is a simulated representation of a 70,000 square foot data center. The interface allows the user to enter the building at any desired location. It is then possible to navigate from image to image in a user-friendly manner. I just wanted you to get an idea of what we're doing on the 3D mapping and the thermal mapping side there. Um, so back, back to the predictive maintenance. Uh, uh, Eric, if you can hear me, I'm going to let you take over and I'll, I'll, I'll advance the slides whenever you let, tell me. That sounds great. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out was that while we were doing the thermal mapping on that data center, we actually found one of the electrical, uh, the $32 million electrical bus duct connection. We also found all those other uh, problems with the widths and with the cords. We found those while we were doing the thermal mapping uh, because that's out on the floor. It's not really included in most of the electrical uh, switch gear infrared testing that we do. On the utility feeds, this is actually seven miles from a data center, but this is a critical connection because it's what feeds the data center on its primary utility feed. So by our pushing them to check this equipment, and, and what's really odd is that this was the only problem that I found in the entire substation, and it was on exactly what we wanted to, to check. So that was a worst case scenario on that. Okay. Next slide, Greg. All right. On the utility feeds, also the transformers have to be checked. If you if the transformers are owned by and that other utility substation was was done in coordinated efforts with Duke Power, who loves when we find problems because they're concerned about the the supply of electricity as much as the data center. And they, they do infrared themselves, we do infrared with them, and they promote and use infrared on a daily basis. In their transformers, you want to look at, this is the secondary side and not the primary side, but what, what we find there are bushing problems, connection problems, and on the primary side, a lot of times we find primary stress cone connections. But in this case, you want to take the images and make sure they're clear and concise and give those to Duke Power, and Duke Power will go in and fix these problems immediately. They're very interested in, in repairing and, uh, and completing those. Okay? Greg? More transformer problems, and this is actually a high load. In, in a lot of conditions, you find a single problem, and this, this transformer was being overloaded, and it's not easy to find the load on a transformer 
because that has to be taken by the utility. Okay. On main breakers, this is where you have to be very careful, and especially in a data center, you have to make sure that everything's been done to promote the maintenance window work and everyone knows that the work's going to be done so that you can make sure you do it in a maintenance window and you're not going to cause a failure. And you may cause a failure, but if the maintenance window is, is there to make sure that you can do the work in the best time possible. On these conditions and main breakers, you have to look from every different angle. You have to look at the line side and the load side and also the back of the breaker. It becomes tough in some conditions when you find small problems, but those problems have to be shown to the management so that they can make decisions on the next step. Okay? Should be, you know, kept in mind that if you're operating a data center, and you find a problem like this, or, or your thermographer, which is our service, finds a, a problem like this, it's not going to cause a shutdown that could have happened. The whole point of this work is to prevent your data center from having failures. Uh, there's, a, there's the risk that you... Uh, incur is that you don't find these things and then they come back later and bite you. Okay. Automatic transfer switches have to be shot in the normal feed and if they so choose you start the generator, you load the generator and you shoot that equipment under the same conditions except on the emergency or generator feed. That's very important because if you, if you ever need the generator and it goes to it and it fails, <laughs> then you could have found that in certain situations. You can also, during sometimes, you can act, during the initial commissioning, you have to, to check it when it's loaded. It's very important to do this because you, you can get to a point where you don't have the conditions available to check it. So it has to be commissioned and it has to be documented fully. That's another thing that we promote is documentation, whether the, pro whether the piece of equipment has a problem or not, you have to document that it didn't have a problem and can't just do a hotspot survey in a data center because there's too much accountability to not document that it is in good working order, okay? Uh, UPS modules, we have to, we're going to go over a little bit of arc flash uh, discussion in just a moment, but UPS modules, mo a lot of levers are 575 volts. That requires much more personal protective equipment, much more arc flash equipment, and it needs to be also known that in those UPS rooms, there's an, a huge amount of airflow. You have to have loose article control. You can't have anything of one small piece of paper from a piece of gum or aluminum, anything that's conductive, can fly into that equipment and cause a major million-dollar shutdown. So when you're doing this, you have to be very, very careful. Only carry the equipment you need in and maintain control of the panels and the doors at all times. This is just an example of input filters and very, very small problems that we, we continue to find on these, these lugs and fix on a general basis. But we caught every one of them at, as you can see, 5.4 degrees delta T. That's where you want to catch them. You don't want to let them get to a point where they're, they're much more of a temperature difference and could possibly cause a problem. Okay? This piece of equipment was actually, I was doing a pre-UPS uh, uh, biannual check on this, and I visually found this. This piece of equipment was not under load. This was actually a problem on a piece of equipment that had, had welded itself together. It was under power, but that 
lug itself was not hot. As you can tell, it's been severely damaged, and they had to shut that piece, that UPS down, and replace that whole module. Okay, Greg? Here's another problem on one of the UPS modules. When you're checking those UPS modules also, you have to have a systematic analysis of, of the UPS module. You have to look from different angles, and you have to know what you're looking at, and you have to look for the lugs that you have to identify and document. Also, we end up documenting every single piece of equipment in these UPSs so that if anything does fail, you can go back and make sure that it wasn't a problem during the survey. Okay? That was 212 degrees delta T. That was certainly not 1.7 degrees. He said the other one was that had welded itself. Just another example of a UPS module. This is, these are the battery connections. The UPS module, we can't go into great depth today, but what happens in a UPS module is you take AC, convert it to DC, hook a parallel to the battery, and then uh, back to AC to supply so that if anything happens, the batteries can carry the load for a safe shutdown. In this case, the battery connection itself was a problem. Okay? Another small, small lug. This is 49 degrees delta T right there. But in a lot of these conditions, you have to look and compare the temperatures of each of the different components as you're looking at them. This ended up being a problem, and on the next uh, outage, it was taken apart, put together, and as a follow-up to every single problem we find, we go in and specifically document the repaired equipment and put the repaired equipment with this and turn that in as a finding also. We show the image that it's been repaired, the date, the time, and we can take it off the critical list. Okay. <laughs> this UPS module had a huge problem, 268 degrees. It was a large enough problem to shut down immediately. This was, uh, this was damaged equipment, and that fuse and fuse assembly, the entire module had to be uh, replaced before we could start back up, and that postponed that commissioning of that switchgear. Uh, for about a week and a half. Okay? Another UPS module, another problem, and another, this was an easy one to find, 611 degrees delta T. That was critical mass. That was at a point where something could have uh, exploded. Okay? DC battery banks are a tricky thing when you when you do a load test on a battery bank. What you have to do is you have to put that you have to before you do the survey you have to come to grips you have to determine what is the temperature at which you're going to shut down because this occurs in a 12 minute interval and you've got 200 batteries to check in 12 minutes and you have to when some when you do find a problem you have to have a predetermined delta T because if you stop the test, you cannot continue the test until three or four days later because you have to charge the batteries and float charge them until they're perfectly uh, charged again to do it. In this case, what you're looking for are the connections on the terminals and also in the batteries. We'll go through a couple examples right here fairly quickly. Okay. <laughs> Another lug connection on a uh, battery. This is an easy one to see. It was only 11 degrees, but there's only one time to check this. is when you hook up a resistive load to the battery bank and you do a full, full discharge. So any problems that occur in any way, shape, or form have to be repaired. Okay? This battery connection. A lot of these batteries have these connections. You can see one thing you can see visual is you can, a lot of times you can see the grease boiling on these connections. This was only 16 degrees delta T. This was pointed out and repaired by the battery, uh, the battery technician, and was put back into service without a problem and checked after it was done. 
okay? These are smaller banks of batteries. These are the cabinet batteries. Uh, this was actually an internal battery problem. And in this case, we found several batteries that failed. In this case also, you have to know that you do the battery discharge test, and when that occurs, you have to check it two to three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes after the battery discharge, because this was an internal problem that showed up five, ten minutes after the test was complete. Okay? Uh, just another internal battery problem. It's clearly obvious uh, and was noted probably 15 minutes after the test was completed, okay? A small lug. This is UPS output breakers. Be very careful on this. These are post-UPS. Any failures on these are a failure in the system, okay? Same on the UPS breakers. You have to be very critical and you have to know the loads on each. Most of these are linear loads. Their A, B, and C are the same. But in this case, you've got a problem on phase A, okay? PDUs, this was actually a PDU that was put in. An entire data center was put in, as you can see, with snap-in breakers. The entire data center had to be re-outfitted with, uh, with, with breakers that had screws, and they, it, was a, it was a major issue because they had planned on the data center being up and running, and this was one of the first tests on it, but this was a major problem. It had to be re- each one of the panels had to be redone with breakers that had were not snapping and pre-tested also, okay? This is just a crack unit, one of the cooling uh, computer room air conditioners, and this is the main breaker in the crack. Those have to be checked. We found problems on those as well as uh, connections on all the fuse box and, uh, and crimped connection, okay? Rooftop chillers, as important as the crack unit itself, you have to do these while they're under load. Uh, just a normal breaker, okay? Resistive load testing, you have to make sure you do full documentation at different loads. You want to start low, make sure you have no problems, and continue up each time waiting on the infrared guy to say that everything looks in good condition, okay? On these, you also have to look at the resistive load connection. A lot of these swedge locks have problems, and when they rent these cables, you have to, you have to, first thing you have to do is make sure you've got good cables to and from the resistive load, okay? And there'll be a couple more of these resistive load connections. One more resistive load connection. That wasn't too hard to see. That was 105 degrees. In some of these cases, you, they have to postpone the test if they don't have the cables that can supply the load safely. Okay? This is a small unit that's used to, to do resistive load testing on PDUs. As you can easily see, that has a major problem on it. We had actually on this particular problem, they corrected that by repairing that swedge lock connection. That probably took an hour, okay? And then you can see on this one, we also documented that it was repaired. This is the NFP70 arc flash protection that's required when checking uh, electrical equipment, and that's just an example of what it looks like when you're doing that. I'm going to play the okay. video now for the um, – um, we have a, a partner company, which is Iris. Um, they manufacture windows, and they're infrared windows. So imagine you got a panel, and I'm going to bring up a, a slide here. So – I'll be right back to that. So what you can do is you can put in these 
uh, infrared windows and then check the piece of equipment, you know, eight to five instead of having to do it on a maintenance window, which Eric was talking about, which are usually done you know, midnight on Saturday night till six o'clock in the morning when they're just idling the data. And uh, so let me play this, um, this video about ArcFlash. An arc flash is not a myth. An arc flash event occurs daily in industrial workplaces, just like yours. On average, one fatality or serious injury occurs every 3.2 hours as a result of an arc flash event. Iris has proudly been known as the designer, engineer, and manufacturer of the world's first and only industrial grade infrared windows. This is the CIP V6, which is a 6 inch infrared and visual viewing window. This meets everything you need, but we don't have to make it just 6 inches. We can make it 24 inches, 12 inches, any size you want, but the standard offerings are 6, 12, and 24. Iris never overlooks a detail, neither should you. At Iris, your safety is our primary concern. Iris, see what you've been missing. For more information, please contact us on the World Wide Web at www.iris.com. So what we do is we can go in to look at your switch gear and decide where and how big a window that you need to put in. This is a service of Data Sent IR. And then we can customize and we have um, uh, an agreement with with Iris and and they will um, engineer these and even custom as as you could see from my friend Martin Robinson um, they have they can build customized windows to any kind of uh, piece of equipment. This reduces the chances of having problems. It's a great idea. Um, I'm going to go back here. Infrared windows allow for standards compliance, safety, risk management, and data management, and also cost savings. And we have this on our website. Uh, by the way, uh, this 10 things you need to know about infrared windows, you can download that on the Data Sent IR website as well. It's a great, great piece of uh, literature. So I'd like to thank Eric and John Finlayson and by video uh, Martin Robinson for helping us out on this, on this webinar. If you have any questions or want to know anything about our services or anything that we're doing, um, need a proposal for doing thermal mapping or predictive maintenance in your data center, you can Go to the website and fill out the form. You can call 800-248-SCAN or you can go to t or email us at techteam at datacentir.com. And I, I want to thank everybody uh, for being on the call and I hope you have a great 4th of July weekend. See you everybody.